but you're coming to Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Hebrews twelve twenty two to 24 In these verses, the apostle draws between Judaism and Christianity in which he displays the immeasurable superiority of the latter over the former, though there may not be in them much of a personal interest to some of our listeners. Yet we feel it incumbent upon us to give the same careful attention to this passage as we have to the previous sections of this epistle. The central design of the apostle in verses 18 to 24 was to convince the believing Hebrews of the preeminence of the new covenant above the old, that is, of the gospel economy over the legal one. To this end, he first directed attention to the awful phenomena which attended the institution of Judaism, and now he sets before them the attractive features which characterizes Christianity. Everything connected with the giving of the law was fearful and terrifying. But all that marks the evangelical system is blessed and winsome. The manifestation of the divine presence at Sinai, though vivid and truly magnificent, was awe-inspiring. But the revelation of his love and grace in the gospel prompts to peace and joy. Those pertain to things of the earth. These concern heaven itself. Those were addressed to the senses of the body. These call into exercise the higher faculties of the soul. When going over verses 18 to 21, we sought to make clear the figurative meaning of their contents. Though there be in them an allusion to historical facts, yet it should be obvious that it is not with their literal signification the apostle was chiefly concerned. As this may not be fully apparent to some of our listeners, we must labor the point a little, rendered more necessary by the gross and carnal ideas entertained by some Bible students. Surely it is quite plain to any unbiased mind that when he said, For you are not coming to the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire. Verse 18. The apostle had reference to something else than a mountain in Arabia. There would be neither force nor even sense in telling Christians you are not come to Mount Sinai. Why, even of the Hebrew believers, it is impossible that any of them had ever seen it. If then the words for you are not come into the mountain that might be touched refer not to any material mount, then they must intimate that order of things which was formally inaugurated at Sinai, the moral features of which were suitably symbolized and strikingly adumbrated by the physical phenomena which attended the giving of the law. This we sought to show in the course of the two preceding articles. Now the same principle of interpretation holds good and must be applied to the terms of the passage upon which we are now entering. But you are coming to Mount Zion. No more has reference to a natural mountain than we have an altar, Hebrew 13.10, means that Christians have a tangible and visible altar. Whatever future the heavenly Zion may yet have, it is the antitypical, the spiritual, the heavenly Zion which is here in view. One of the hardest tasks, which sometimes confronts a careful and honest expositor of holy writ, is to determine when its language is to be understood literally and when it is to be regarded as figurative. Nor is this always to be settled so easily as many suppose. The controversy upon the meaning of our Lord's words at the institution of the Holy Supper, this is my body, shows otherwise. It has been a simple manner for him to say, this bread represents my body. But he did not. Why is best known to himself? Nor does this example stand by any means alone. Much of Christ's language was of a figurative character, and more than once his own apostles failed to understand his purpose. No, it is by no means always an easy matter to determine when the language of Scripture is to be regarded literally, to say nothing about many poetic expressions in the Psalms, such as he makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
and symbolic language in the prophets, like, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Take such a saying of our Lord's as this, There is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions. Mark ten twenty nine 29, and 30. The impossibility of literalizing such a promise appears, for example, in a man's receiving, or having a hundred mothers. Now, if that statement is not to be interpreted literally, why should an outcry be raised if the writer presents good reasons for interpreting other verses figuratively? After reading the above, some may be inclined to say, all of this is very bewildering and confusing. Our reply is, then you must have sat under very superficial preaching. Any well-instructed scribe would have taught you that there is great variety used in the language of the Bible and often much care and pains are required in order to ascertain its precise character. That is one reason why God has graciously provided teachers, Ephesians 4, verse 11, for his people. True, the path of duty is so plainly defined for us, that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. But that does not alter the fact, that in order to ascertain the exact significance of many particular expressions of Scripture, Much prayer and comparing passage with passage is called for. The Bible is not a lazy man's book, and the Holy Spirit has designedly put not a little therein to stain the pride of men. Now much help is obtained upon this difficulty by recognizing that many of the things which pertain to the New Covenant are expressed in language taken from the Old, the anti-type being presented under the phraseology of the type. For example, when Christ announced a free intercourse between heaven and earth, which was to result from his mediation, he described it to Nathanael in the words of Jacob's vision, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. John 1 verse 51 Not that the Lord Jesus was ever to present the appearance of a ladder for that purpose, such as a patriarch saw in his dream, but that spiritually there would be a like medium of communication established and the agency of a like intercourse maintained. In a similar manner, the death of Christ is frequently spoken of under the terms of the Levitical sacrifices, while the application of his atonement to the soul is called the sprinkling of his blood on the conscience. Not until we clearly perceive that most of that which pertains to the new economy is exhibited to us under the images of the old are we in a position to understand much of the language found in the prophets and many of the expressions employed by our Lord and his apostles. Thus Christ is spoken of as our Passover and as priest after the order of Melchizedek. Paradise is described as Abraham's bosom. The New Testament saints are referred to as the children of Abraham, as the Israel of God, Galatians 6, verse 16, as a circumcision, as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is a mother of us all, Galatians 4, verse 26. Such terminology as ish should amply prepare us for you are come unto Mount Zion, and should remove all uncertainty is what is denoted by it. But you are come unto Mount Zion. In these words, the apostle commences a second member of the comparison between Judaism and Christianity, which completes the foundation on which he bases the great exhortation found in verses 25 to 29. In a former member, verses 18 to 21, He had described the state of the Israelite people and the church in it as they existed under the legal economy, taken from the terror-producing character of the giving of the law and the nature of its demands. They could not endure that which was commanded. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. 
But now the apostle contrasted the blessed and glorious state into which believers have been called by the gospel, by this making manifest how incomparably more excellent was the new covenant in itself than the old, and how infinitely more beneficial are its privileges to those whom divine grace gives a part therein. No less than eight of these privileges are here enumerated, always the number of a new beginning that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, Ephesians 1, verse 10. These words throw light on the passage now before us. All the spiritual things of grace and glory, both in heaven and earth, have been headed up in Christ, so that they all now center in him. By his mediatorial work, the Lord Jesus has repaired the great breach which the sin of Adam entailed. Before sin entered into the world, there was a perfect harmony between heaven and earth, men and angels uniting and hymning their glorious creator. Together they form one spiritual society of worshipers. But upon the fall, that spiritual union was broken, and not only did the human race, in their federal head, become alienated from God himself, but they became alienated from the holy spirits which surround his throne. But the last Adam has restored the disruption which the first Adam's sin produced, and in reconciling his people to God, he has also brought them back into fellowship with the angelic hosts. And because God is gathered together in one, recapitulated or headed up all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, when we savingly come to Christ, we at the same time come to all that God has made to center in him, or in other words, we obtain an interest or right in all that is headed up in him. Let the listener seek to grasp clearly this fact. It is because believers have been brought to Christ that they are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. By their initiation into the gospel state, Christians are also inducted into and given access unto all these privileges. Christ and his mediation are specifically mentioned at the close of the various privileges here listed, verse 24. To teach us, it is on that account we are interested in them, and as a reason for our being so interested. As it is to Christ and him alone, though not, of course, to the exclusion of the Father and his eternal love or the Holy Spirit and his gracious operations, that the Christian owes every blessing, his standing before God, his new creation state, his induction into the society of the holy, his eternal inheritance. It was by Christ that he was delivered from the condemnation and curse of the law, with the unspeakable terror it caused him. And it is by Christ that he has been brought to the antitypical Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem, not by anything he has done or will do, or such inestimable blessings made his. Observe how jealously the Spirit of Truth has guarded this very point. In using the passive and not the active voice, the verb is, You are come and not you have come. The same fact is emphasized again in 1 Peter 2, verse 25. You were a sheep going astray. You are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls, because of what the Spirit wrought in us, we being entirely passive. But you are coming to Mount Zion. We need hardly say that this language looks back to the sign of the Old Testament, the variation in spelling being due to the difference between the Hebrew and the Greek. It is, in fact, to the Old Testament we must turn for light upon our present verse. And, as usual, the initial reference is the one which supplies us with the needed key. The first time that Zion is mentioned there is in Second Samuel 5, verses 6 and 7. And a king and his men went to Jerusalem to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same as the city of David. The deeper significance of this appears when we carefully ponder its setting. Zion was captured by David when Israel had been thoroughly tried and found completely wanting. 
It occurred at a notable crisis in the history of the nation, namely after the priesthood had been deplorably corrupted, 1 Samuel 2, verses 22 and 25, and after the king of their choice, Saul, had reduced himself, 1 Samuel 28, verse 7, and then 1 Samuel 31, 1 and 7, to the lowest degradation. It was then at a time when Israel's fortunes were at a low ebb, when they were thoroughly disheartened, and when, because of their great wickedness, they had the least reason to expect it, did God graciously intervene. Just when Saul and Jonathan had been slain in battle, when the Philistines triumphed and Israel had fled before them in dismay, the Lord brought forth a man of his choice, David, whose name means the Beloved. Up to this time, the hill of Zion had been a continual menace to Israel. But now David wrested it out of the hand of the Jebusites and made it a stronghold of Jerusalem. On one of its eminences, the temple was erected, which was the dwelling place of Jehovah in the midst of his people. Zion then stands for the highest revelation of divine grace in the Old Testament times. Zion lay to the southwest of Jerusalem, being the oldest and highest part of that ancient city. It was outside of the city itself and separate from it, though in scripture frequently identified with it. Mount Zion had two heads, or peaks, Moriah, on which the temple was erected, the seat of the worship of God, and the other, whereon the palace of David was built, the royal residence of the kings of Judah, a striking figure of the priestly and kingly offices meeting in Christ. Zion then was situated in the best part of the world. Canaan, a land which flowed with milk and honey in the best part of that land, due to its portion, in the best part of its heritage, Jerusalem, and in the best part of that metropolis, the highest point, the city of David. Let the interested listener carefully ponder the following passages and observe the precious things said of Zion. Psalm 48, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 50, verse 2. Psalm 132, verses 13 and 14, and Psalm 133, verse 3. Zion is first the place of God's habitation, where he dwells forever. Psalm 9, verse 11. Psalm 76, verse 2. Second, it is the seed of the throne, reign, and kingdom of Christ. Psalm 2, verse 6. Isaiah 24, verse 23. Third, it is the object of divine promises, innumerable. Psalm 125, verse 1, Psalm 128, verse 5, of Christ himself, Isaiah 59, verse 20. Fourth, thence did the gospel proceed and the law of Christ come forth. But you were come unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And as the apostle prefers the privileges of the gospel, not only above what the people were made partakers of at Sinai in the wilderness, but also above all that they afterwards enjoyed in Jerusalem and the land of Canaan. In the glory and privileges of that city, the Hebrews greatly boasted, but the apostle cast that city in the state in which it then was into the same condition with Mount Sinai in Arabia, that is under bondage, as indeed it then was, Galatians 4, verse 25. And he opposes thereunto that Jerusalem which is above, that is, this heavenly Jerusalem. This is the second privilege of the gospel state in which all the remaining promises of the Old Testament are transferred and made over to believers. Whatever is spoken of the city of God or of Jerusalem, that is spiritual that contains in it the love or favor of God. It is all made theirs. Faith can lay a claim to it all. Believers are so come to the city as to the inhabitants, free denizens, possessors of it, to whom all the fights, privileges, and immunities of it belong. And what is spoken of it in the scripture is ground of faith to them, and a spring of consolation. For they may with consolation make application of what is so spoken to themselves in every condition. A city is the only place of rest, peace, safety, and honor among men in this world. To all these, in the spiritual sense, we are brought by the gospel. All men are under the law there at Sinai, in a wilderness, where is none of these things. 
the souls of sinners can find no place of rest or safety under the law. But we have all these things by the gospel, rest in Christ, peace with God, order in the communion of faith, safety and divine protection and honor in our relation to God in Christ, in quote John Owen.